Even now, the word still makes you smile. Remember how nervous you were? How unprepared you felt? Remember how you doubted and worried? Then they were born and none of that mattered. They were all laughter and smiles and changed you in all the ways you hoped they would. Your best days were spent rolling around on the living room floor, joy more real than it had ever been. And maybe you never stopped doubting. Maybe you never stopped worrying. Maybe you made mistakes. Maybe there was a time you wanted to run. But you're here, now. Day after day, you've held your family together. Always there, an anchor, a tether. As a father, you've been a storm shelter, safe and warm. You have given your children enough space to grow, but strong arms to run back to. And you've held it up. Everything. The weight of the world has left marks on your hands and shoulders. Bruised and beaten, torn and weakened, you never stop picking yourself up. I've watched you gather the pieces of yourself and give them to the ones you love. And I wanted to tell you, it's enough. You are enough when you're hurting, heartbroken, bleeding. You're enough when you're weary, slumped, shouldered, barely standing. You have a father of your own, steadfast and able. He is still when you are shaking and strong when you are breaking. You don't go unnoticed. You're not alone. Thank you for making a house a home. Again, good morning, church family. So great to see you guys in the room. And for those of you joining us online, welcome to church. We're beginning a new sermon series today called The Family Likeness. What does it look like when we look like God himself and his family? And so we want to encourage one another to continue to pursue that transformation of, of from the inside out where we would look more and more like Jesus on a daily basis. And so that's kind of the crux of what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. Uh, as we get uh, closer to July 1st, we'll kind of be wrapping this series up then. And we've got more fun things planned uh, for the rest of the summer. But man, I'm just, I'm just grateful to be in the room with you guys. I've missed you. I've uh, been gone for a few weeks. We were overseas in Scotland with our discipleship school on a mission trip and had an amazing time and saw saw God do incredible things and saw uh, people go truly from darkness to light. And if you were here this past Wednesday night uh, for our block party, you heard some of the testimonies of what God did. And uh, man, if you missed that, would love to share those with you a little bit later. But God just moved in a powerful way. And then we just took an opportunity. I hope it's okay. But my family, we need a vacation every now and then. And so after the mission trip, uh, we just we just stayed. We said, well, well you're in Europe. Now, stay a little bit, right? So we, we stayed and we hung out and we did some hiking as a family, which was incredible. And then we've got friends that live outside of London and saw those guys and friends that live in Birmingham, England. And we got to connect with them as well. Just a great, refreshing time for us. And so uh, I'm glad to be back, though, because last Sunday I was trying to watch online. And you guys know this. Online is great to just kind of track a little bit and stay somewhat connected when you can't be in the room. But there is no replacement for being in the room. I just, you, you, there, you can't replicate being in a room full of people, worshiping Jesus together, high-fiving, giving fist bumps and hugs, and so it's incredible to be able to just be back together with you guys. We missed you, uh, but we've praying, been praying for you, and obviously we continue to do that, and so today as I get started with this series, I'm just excited to just kind of let out of what's been uh, stored up on the inside of me, and it all kind of started for me actually months ago as we were thinking about this sermon series, just desiring, Lord, we want to be more like you. We don't want to look like the world looks. We don't want to look like what our favorite news channel would want us to look like. We don't want to look like what our particular social media feed would have us to look like. And we don't want all of our thoughts to be based around what the world is thinking about. God, we want to go after you. We need more of Jesus. If there's anything that the world needs, it's, it's a Jesus church. It's a group of people that say, we just want more of God, less of us and more of you. And that's the prayer of us as a people, as a church. That's who we want to be. That's, we talk about it all the time. 
but you know, that requires on a daily basis that we actually say, okay, now, Lord, that's a great bumper sticker statement, but now we needed to actually be put into action. And so unless we really can get into the word of God and wrestle with that and then even contemplate in our 30 minutes or so together as I'm speaking, uh, just what that means for us personally, then oftentimes that life transformation doesn't happen. We kind of get the goosebumps during worship and we, we feel inspired in our heart through what's heard. But then if we don't actually apply it to our life, we walk out of the door and we're actually the, you know, five, 10 minutes later, the same person we were before we walked in. And so my desire is that today that we would all actually be transformed as we look into God's word and that we would walk out of here different. We would walk out of here looking more like Jesus. I, one of my favorite stories in scripture is where Moses would meet with God, the scripture says, and it says that he would talk to him face to face as one talks with a friend. And when Moses would return from meeting with God, his face would shine. There would there'd literally be glory on his face and everyone knew, man, he has met with God. And my prayer is always, man, wherever you go this week, whether you go out to lunch today or whether it's to work uh, sometime this week or even on vacation and you're interacting with people as you go along, that people would see you and recognize there's something different about him. There's something different about her. And it would be, you've been with Jesus. It says, in, even in the book of Acts, when they recognized the first followers of Jesus, they said there was something different about them and they marked them as those who had been with Jesus. Man, isn't that awesome? What would it mean for you and your family to have a reputation of those that had been with Jesus? What would it mean for us as a church family just to have a reputation in the community of, hey, I don't know everything about those group of people, but I can tell you one thing, they meet with Jesus. Something changes in that group of people when they gather together. Well, that's my prayer for us today. And as I was coming home on the airplane, the, the miserable nine-hour flight from Europe, that's the worst part. You know, you can get there, you can have a great time, but you gotta deal with nine hours of just incredible torture, sitting in a, a narrow tube full of people, coughing all over each other, and you're like, oh, Lord, I'll have COVID by the morning, you know? And, uh, but as I'm sitting there just trying to pass time, I was looking at the movies, you know, it's like trash, 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 trash. Everything's trash. And then I finally found one. I was like, oh, I think this might be good. American Underdog. I don't know if you guys have seen that yet. It's the story of Kurt Warner, who is an MVP uh, uh, quarterback in the NFL. But his story is actually amazing. He's one of the most successful quarterbacks in the NFL who was actually went undrafted. He was unnoticed coming out of college. And so that movie is a, just a little bit of his story. And I'm not going to tell you the whole thing. It, it, it'd be worth uh, your time, I would say so. Uh, it's not the greatest movie I've ever seen, but it was a good inspirational story. And one of the things about his story that I just so identify with, especially coming into Father's Day, is Kurt, as he was kind of trying to find himself, young adult, he was still in college and knew that there was a call for something special on his life. Uh, he, met a, he met a woman and she was divorced and had two kids, but he really kind of fell for her head over heels. And so he just pursued her and he, he went over to her house one day and, and met the kids. And for one of the kids in particular was a, was a young boy who was blind. His name was Zach. This is all true life uh, story. So it's the Hollywood version, but it's also really uh, what happened. And Kurt just really connected with this young boy. And there's this scene in the movie. And from what I've understood from reading about it afterwards, this really happened. This young boy, Zach, when Kurt came in the house, just kind of connected with him, went over to him, blind, grabbed him by the hand and, and showed him a little car that he liked to play with. And they ended up singing a little song or Zach sang a song to Kurt and they just bonded in that moment. Bonded so much so that later on in the story, he gets married to the mom and all that stuff. Well, his wife would say that Kurt and Zach fell in love with one another before Kurt and his now wife fell in love with one another. There was a connection with that kiddo. Why? Because every human heart longs to connect with a dad. There's something on the inside of us that longs to have a healthy relationship with dad. And here's the, the hard thing about that. Many of us in this room have maybe not had such a great relationship with our earthly father. Some of us don't even know our earthly father. Maybe he was never around. Maybe he left long before you were old enough to remember. Or maybe growing up with dad was difficult because he was either super hard on you or maybe he was distant. Maybe he wasn't there when you need. There's just, there's so much hurt around uh, dads. But I also want you to know that there are actually, uh, there, there's actually some of us that have had some healthy experiences with our dad, but even those would have had healthy experiences with their earthly father, even earthly fathers fall short at times. 
And so Father's Day can sometimes be a little bit of a mix of emotion. And even as a dad, I know I can speak for other dads in the room. There's this weird kind of emotion of you waking up and your family saying, hey, happy Father's Day, dad. And yet I'm always so aware of the ways that I fall short as a dad. Do you not, men, do you not have that, those of you that are dads have that that's just sense of, and I'm thankful that they're saying happy Father's Day today, but man, I just, I wish I could do better. I, I wish I was more consistent. And it's just a part of the human struggle of trying to be a good dad. And yet it's so important to us. And that's why the good news is we have a heavenly father who covers all of the hurt and all of the shortfalls. He steps in maybe where your dad was absent or your dad was overbearing or, or your dad did not represent the heart of God. Your heavenly father actually wants to come in and create healing and, and provide that place of right understanding of what a, of a strong and a good dad in your life can be. But not only that, to the dads, he wants to be a model for you. He wants to say, hey, let me help you be a good dad to those that I've entrusted to your world. And so as I was watching Kurt Warner's story, there's something on the inside of me, it just, it sparked. I don't know why this is, but I tend to get emotional on airplanes. It's probably the long flight, but I'm, every time I watch a movie, something just, it gets me deep. And so as I was watching that connection between that young boy, Zach, and Kurt, who wasn't even yet his father, but was coming into the scene and would eventually become his dad and would adopt the kids and marry the mom and even bring more kids into the picture, I just said, man, I, I, want, I want that, and I know the men in our church want that. So we're gonna talk about this morning what it looks like to not only be a great dad, but even for those of you in the room who are not yet uh, dads, maybe biologically, everyone has an opportunity to be a spiritual dad. Every man in the room has an opportunity to be a man of God who lives out the qualities of what it means to be a man of God. And so this morning, my goal is to not browbeat you and me as a dad. My goal is to encourage us from the word of God because I know every single man in this room wants to rise up. You wanna be a man of God. You wouldn't be sitting in the room if you didn't have something deep down in you that wanted to be a man of God. So that's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna look at what it looks like to be a man of God. We're gonna be in the book of Ruth, so if you brought your Bible, uh, you may wanna turn there, stick your thumb in there. I'm gonna have scriptures on the screen, and so you can follow along with what I'm gonna read there, but this might be one of my favorite books in the Bible. I tend to kind of circle back to this book every year, a couple years uh, at the most. I'm, I'm gonna circle back around because there's such great nuggets of what it looks like to be both men and women of God in the book of Ruth. We see it uh, represented for us, and it's um, kind of played out for us in a number of different folks that are in the Bible, but specifically today, we're gonna be looking uh, at a man by the name of Boaz, and he's central to the story in the book of Ruth, and if you've grown up in church or you've read the Bible, then you might remember the story of Boaz, but just to kind of get us all on the same page to kind of set up what we're gonna be looking at before we meet Boaz, the book of Ruth is actually named after a woman uh, who had great character of God, but she wasn't born into a family that worshiped Yahweh. In fact, she came from a completely different religion, but she had married a man uh, who, uh, whose family worshiped Yahweh, but her husband died. And so now here she is with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Naomi's husband has also died. And so the men and the family are now gone. And as the story begins to pick up very early in chapter one of Ruth, we see Naomi and her daughters-in-law. And she said, look, this is a bad situation. In this particular day and time, women did not have the right to, uh, to even uh, own property and to hold property. It was all handled through the men in their lives. And so it was either a husband or a son or a dad or an uncle. Some male figure was required to cover the women. Because if there wasn't a male figure, that, those women, they couldn't have a job. They, there, there was no way to go out and earn anything, to put food on the table. It was a very, very desperate situation. They were completely dependent upon the generosity of, of others, even strangers. And hopefully they would have some sort of family member somewhere that they could reach out to. And so there was even an understanding in that culture that distant relatives, specifically the males, were responsible for taking care of any females, even distant relatives, if the men in their lives had passed away or were no longer around. So the story begins with Naomi looking at Ruth and saying, go back home to your own people. I can't take care of you. My husband's gone. Your, my son, your husband is gone. We are in a bad situation and you should just go back home. Um, beautiful story that I'm not going to go into today. We'll get to it next week. But Ruth actually responds with, no, uh, your God will be my God. 
and your people will be my people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with you. And so, so Ruth and Naomi, they stick together, but the situation is still very, uh, very precarious, and they're not even sure how they're gonna get food. And so really, it was down to begging. And so they go back to where Naomi was from, and uh, literally, Naomi says to Ruth, why don't you go out into the fields? And often what would happen is, as the men would go through the fields picking the crops, uh, those that were poor and those that didn't have anything would kind of just hang out in, on, on the edges of the field and even just kind of come along behind the workers, and they would just pick up the leftovers. And if the workers kind of dropped something or it was just the scraps of what they didn't actually want to hold on to, then, then those that were poor and, and those that didn't have any means could come along and they could get a little bit of something, something to put on the table. And so this is what uh, Ruth would do. And so uh, Naomi sent Ruth out to do that. And then she ended up in a field of a man by the name of Boaz. She didn't know it at the time, but she had uh, been led to a field. And so as she gets there, um, she's doing this. And the men that are working in the field recognize that she's doing this. And they also begin to find out who she is. This is the daughter of Naomi. Well, Boaz, who owns the field, actually then shows up and he asks his men, hey, who's this woman? I've never seen her before. And they share the story of Ruth and Naomi and something in Boaz's heart begins to awaken and he says, hey, I, I want to do something for this lady. And so in Ruth chapter two, verse eight, it says this. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. The first thing that we see, I'm just gonna be pulling out of these verses some qualities that we see in the men of God and specifically those that can be father figures in our life. The first thing we see is that he's an initiator. Boaz was an initiator. He, he didn't have to talk to her. In fact, there was, there was no even uh, sort of social understanding that he would even be polite to her. She was just a beggar as far as he was concerned. She was just there to kind of pick up what his workers had left. But something in Boaz's heart was awakened to initiate conversation with her. And as he heard her story, he initiated even so much to say, hey, would you stay here? You don't need to go anywhere else. I want to initiate relationship with you. It goes on in verse 9. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. The second thing that we see in a man of God, he's a protector. He's a protector. Not only is he initiating with her, but he's saying, hey, I, I know that everyone looks at you as property. I, I know that you don't, you don't have any legal standing, but I'm gonna come in and cover you in this situation. I've told my men not to lay a hand on you. See, this, the reason this was important is because literally the men in that field, they could have just taken her and done whatever they wanted to do with her. She, not only does she not have legal standing, but without a husband or an uncle or a father or some male covering in her life, she literally could be used like you would drive your car, just a, a piece of property to be used by any men that might want to take advantage of her. But Boaz was a protector, and he said, so I've told my, man, my men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. I love that Boaz uh, presents for us this, what it looks like to be an initiator and a protector. These are two of the biggest things and calls on your life as a man and as a father, those of you that are fathers in the room, is that you would be an initiator and a protector for those around you. You know this. Deep down on the inside of every single man, there, there's just a natural instinct to want to initiate and to want to protect. The sad thing is, so often our world wants to lull us to sleep as men. One of the biggest challenges that I see in men's life is this uh, propensity towards passivity as opposed to initiating. And I just wanna pause just for a moment. For the ladies in the room, this is not a moment for you to look at your husband and be like, yeah, you need to initiate with that dishwasher, husband. <laughs> Yeah, I see, I see you being passive over there watching sports on Sunday afternoon rather than doing what I need you to do around that. This is not that moment, okay? This is the moment to say, Lord, just work in his heart. Because there is something on the inside of us, every single man, that does desire to be an initiator. But the way the enemy works in our life is he tries to lull us to sleep and create passive men. And when you end up with passive men, you end up with all sorts of trouble at home, at work, in a community. And so the scripture, the reason we look to the word of God is because God puts these people in, our, in front of us to say, look, this is what it looks like to be a man of God. And so as we look at Boaz this morning, men, I'm praying that something on the inside of you will awaken to, what does it look like for me to be an initiator? 
What does it look like for me to be a protector? Who has God given me to take care of? So Boaz um, commits to Ruth. He commits to take care of her. And they eventually end up having this conversation. And, and Ruth says, hey, will, will you take me on as my kinsman redeemer? This is a, an important phrase that we see in the scripture. And this goes back to that legal thing that I was talking about where distant relatives, uh, cousins and whatnot could actually step in and, and take over that that uh, that. that protective place in a woman's life, but not just, I've told my, man, my men not to lay a hand on you, but legally speaking, could provide a place of protection for her. And so Ruth actually says to Buzz, will you do that for me? They, they discover that he is a distant relative of Naomi, and because Ruth is, is Naomi's daughter-in-law and her husband has died, Boaz actually has an opportunity to do that. But in this conversation, Boaz says, actually, there's another relative closer than I am to you, and so the right way to do this, we have to give that other gentleman the opportunity to step forward, but don't worry, I'm gonna make sure you're taken care of. And so after this conversation, Ruth goes home. Ruth tells Naomi, her mother-in-law, all that's, all that's transpired and happened, and Boaz has even given Ruth some extra food and say, here, you, you don't need to go home empty-handed to your mother-in-law, and so he's, he's being generous. And, and she takes all this home and she shares with Naomi what's happened, and I love in Ruth chapter three, verse 18, it says this, then Naomi said, she's talking now to Ruth, having heard the story, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. What did she know about Boaz, who was a man of God? She knew that he would be a way maker. She knew that Boaz, because of who is what his character, he was going to find a way for Naomi and Ruth to be taken care of either through this other gentleman, this other relatives that was closer, or whether he was gonna take on the responsibility himself. And I love how Naomi just says to Ruth, hey, just watch. He's not gonna rest until it's taken care of. Men, is there something on the inside of you that when it comes to your responsibilities, the, the things that you, responsibilities at work, responsibilities at home, responsibility in the community. Is there something inside of you that says, I, I'm gonna initiate here. I'm gonna protect those that I've, I've been called to protect. And I'm also gonna make a way for those that need to have a way made for them. You know, as a man of God, the call on your life is to be a way maker for others. That's the call on your life, to make a way for your kids to make a way for your family, to make a way for your church, to make a way for your employees, to make a way for your coworkers. It's the call on your life to be one who will not rest until the important matters in your life are settled. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to go around all kind of tied up in a knot and nervous and worrying about things all the time, but there's a, there's a confident spirituality of this is, my, this is my thing to take care of. And I won't shirk from my responsibility, but I'll stand in the gap and I'll say, God, Heavenly Father, I feel so inadequate and I, I mess up so often and I lose my temper and I, I end up being passive because I'm tired from work and then I'm not representing what it means to be an initiator at home, but God, I wanna be a way maker. Would you do something in me? Would you do something in us? Is there something on your inside of you that says, God, make me a way maker? Well, he would do that. They would go and they'd have this conversation. Boaz would go to the city center and he would call the elders of the city together and he called this other gentleman uh, to meet with him to have a conversation about Naomi and Ruth because the other man, again, was the closer relative. And he said, hey, here's the situation. Will, will you take responsibility? And the guy says, I'll do it. And so in that moment, it's, it's a little sad moment in the story because you can even just say, even the, the scripture doesn't say it, but you can sense that Naomi and Ruth are probably like, oh, man. Because Boaz was such a great guy and he'd already done so much to take care of them. But Boaz wasn't done yet. And so Boaz says, well, hey, I, I need to make sure you understand the situation. You're gonna need to not only take care of Naomi and the property that belonged to her husband, uh, that she doesn't have any legal right to do anything, which she couldn't sell it, she couldn't benefit from it, but you're gonna have to take over that property. But not only that, her daughter Ruth is here, and because her husband and, and Naomi's son is now dead, you need to take Ruth on as your wife and also all of his property and make sure that his name is not forgotten. This was a part of one of the uh, kinsman redeemer's responsibilities. Not only did he have to take it on, but he had to maintain it in the name of the man that was already passed away. And so hearing that kind of business deal, the guy understood his own situation and his own family and taking care of his own people. He said, oh, I, I, can't, I can't do all that. <laughs> I can't take all of that on. And so Boaz said, well, don't worry about it. I wanna do it. 
And so Boaz does that. He seals a deal there in front of all the elders and uh, they, they had it done right. And in uh, Ruth chapter four, verse nine and 10, it says this, then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion and Malon. And I've also acquired Ruth the Moabite. Malon's widow as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his own his hometown today you are witnesses so I have bought and I have also acquired what I kind of pull out of that is that the man of God is a multiplier wherever the man of God puts his hand to something it's left in a better state than when he found it there's, there's something of increase that happens when a man of God puts his hand to the plow and says, I'm going to step, I'm going to initiate into this situation. I'm going to protect those that I'm responsible to protect. I'm going to look to make a way for those that may not have a way, and I'm going to leave it in a better state than I found it. I'm, I'm going to be a multiplier. As I read that, I, I just began to say, Lord, man, I wanna be like that. I wanna be a man that leaves the, the church that I stepped into four and a half years ago in a stronger and better place than when I found it. I wanna be a man that takes the kids that you've entrusted me to and that as they grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, which is the prayer that we've prayed over our kids since their earliest age, that they would be better off because of me and not worse off that there would be something that that I would pass on, that I would take what's in my cup and I would pour it out into their cup and they could start just a little bit further down the road than I started in my understanding with you because we've been together. Man, is there something on the inside of you men? Is there something on the inside of you dads? Whatever your responsibilities are, whoever your people are, that you see it as a responsibility to not only just to lead them, but to pour into them and to see that they go past you. They get a start in life ahead of where you started, that they go further with God and further with others than maybe you have in your life. I know as a man, that's just something that's on the inside of me that just is stirred. And so as I read about Boaz, I said, God, I want to be a man who multiplies things. So a man of God is an initiator, a protector, a way maker, and a multiplier. That's what we can pull out of the story of Boaz. But here's the beautiful thing about it. Boaz is really our Jesus figure in this story because Jesus is the ultimate at all of these things. When we look at Boaz's life, we're really saying, not only do we wanna be like Boaz, man, we wanna be like Jesus, because Jesus was the ultimate initiator, the ultimate protector, the ultimate way maker, the ultimate multiplier. How did Jesus initiate? Well, he he initiated by coming to earth, right? He came from heaven to earth to show the way. You remember the old song? (laughs) From the earth to the grave, my debt to pay. From the, what did he, what did I say? From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Now I lift your name on high. The 90s called, they want that song back. But anyway, <laughs> that's just still on, the, that's still on the inside of me. He was an initiator. Jesus was the first missionary to do cross-cultural ministry. He initiated with you and me. He put on human flesh. And he came, why? Because he loves you and because he loves me. And so he is our prototype, especially men and dads in the room, that we would be initiators. Jesus was the ultimate protector. What did he say? Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest for your soul. Man, do you feel like life is just beating you up? Do you feel like you're facing challenges that you don't know how to get to the other side? Do you feel like you you lack wisdom or that you just, man, again, maybe your dad was absent and so you you don't have that fatherly wisdom or advice in your life and you're just not sure what to do. Man, Jesus says, hey, I, I can protect you. Come to me, come to me. He was also the ultimate way maker. We sing the song way maker, obviously. But why is that? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Those were Jesus' words. He said, I've made a way back to the Father. I've restored relationship with your ultimate Father, your heavenly Father. And so through me, you can know God intimately. Do you know that? Man, I don't know if you're in the room today or you're watching online and perhaps uh, your wife or your kids said, hey, can, Dad, can we go to church today? And you would say, I'm, I'm not really a church person. I don't really know a whole lot about this. Here's the one thing I would want to make sure you don't miss today. This is not about religion, what we're talking about. This is not some dead set of principles that we just try to live our life by. This is about knowing God. 
having relationship with the living God, he is alive and he wants to have an intimate relationship with you and you can know him in that way. And so if you're in the room, man or woman, and you feel distant from God, I want you to know this morning there is an invitation that Jesus says, I've made a way for you to have relationship. And this, I say this all the time, but I just, it, it's because it's Bible and it's true. He says, I'm standing at the, at the door of your life and I'm knocking. If you'll just open the door, I'll come in and we'll have fellowship. And so he's the ultimate way maker. Man, I hope you're willing to open the door of your life. Jesus is also the ultimate multiplier. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. What I've given to you, I want you to give away to others. He said later, you're gonna receive power when my spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the earth. What was he saying? Everything you've learned from me, now I want you to go and put that into practice. And his whole plan actually was to invest in a small group of people so that it would be multiplied in their lives and that it would go out to others and then be multiplied more. And we're here 2,022 years later because of the multiplication effect of who Jesus was amongst his disciples and then who his disciples were to their disciples and then on and on and on as the torch was passed, the ultimate multiplier. Are you an initiator, a protector, a way maker, or a multiplier? Man, you can look to Jesus in all of those areas as our model. You can look to Boaz as a man who lived these things out as well. Perhaps a great question to ask if you're just kind of wondering, am I, am I doing this? Am, am I doing this right? Uh, one of the things to always do is just to kind of put yourself into the mirror. And so a great question to ask yourself is based on what a man of God looks like, is it obvious to others that I carry the family likeness? Based on what a man of God looks like, and there's so many things I could say, but let's just hold to the four that we talked about this morning, being an initiator, a protector, a way maker, and a multiplier, Based on those principles, is it obvious to others that I carry the family likeness? And again, as I said early on, I just want you to know, man, if you're sitting there thinking, no, I'm not sure it'd be obvious, I want you to know you're not alone, man, because I look at that list and I go, I don't think it's always obvious in my life, but I want it to be. And so today is an opportunity to say, God, will you help me? Will you help me to be an initiator, a protector, a way maker, a multiplier? Where might you need to see that come to play in your life? You know, on July the 1st, when we meet out on the lawn, we're gonna do baptisms. And when we did this a year ago, we had 20 or plus people uh, decide to go public with their decision to follow Jesus. And some of those folks have been actually walking with Jesus for a long time. They had just never taken that step to publicly profess in believer's baptism that they were followers of Jesus. Men, I want you to know one of the most powerful things that you can do for your family as an initiator is to initiate stepping out and publicly professing your faith in Jesus. And you can do that in baptism on, the, on July 1st. If you've never been baptized, my invitation to you is to say, hey, I'm gonna get baptized. This is what I, if it was me, if I'm you, and I'm sitting around the dinner table with my family, and I know that I haven't been baptized, but I know that I wanna follow Jesus, here's how the conversation would go at my house. Hey, family, this may sound weird, um, but I've decided I'm gonna get publicly baptized on July 1st at the church. And if any of you guys have decided to follow Jesus, I'd love for you to join me in that. What would it look like for that conversation to happen around your dinner table? What would it look like for an entire family to take a step of faith? You know, this happened in scripture. Entire households would get saved at one time because the leader of the household, the man in that house would say, we're gonna follow God. And so everyone else would, would come along. Now, here's what we don't want to happen. We don't want you to say, I'm getting baptized, so therefore everybody's getting baptized. <laughs> we don't, homie, don't play that, right? So back to the 90s. I'm in the 90s mode today. Anyway, um, so, but if your kids and if your wife have made their own decision, then they own that. We'd love to actually have a conversation with them. We'd love to get our kids' team involved, especially with your kiddos, to, to make sure they understand what they're doing. But dad, even if no one else gets baptized, even if you're the only one in your family on that day, you've initiated. You've set the mark. You said, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Man, be an initiator. What does it look like to be a protector? Are there any ways that around your house, maybe it's with your own family, or if you're not a dad, maybe it's with your, your own parents, or maybe it's with a brother or sister, or maybe you're an aunt or an uncle, coworkers, what does it look like for you to be a protector this week? Is there somebody that's just kind of getting run over by life? Is there somebody that's being taken advantage of and you can see it? Maybe it's even a stranger on the street. Man, we just need more civil courage today. 
We, just, we just need men to step in when they, when they see an injustice, when something's not right, and to say, hey, this isn't right. Man, what does it look like to be a protector this week and to step in and do that? What does it look like to be a waymaker? Man, I, I was thinking about uh, that just in my own life. I'm going to have an opportunity this coming Saturday. Uh, my oldest son and I, we're going to be flying to Texas for a football camp, and we're taking the red eye back to be here next Sunday, so we won't be missing church in Jesus' name. <laughs> when I see all the canceled flights online, I'm like, oh, Lord, get us back. But uh, we're going to be in Waco next Saturday, and many of you know my story. I was a walk-on football player at Baylor, and so there, I have a little bit of an understanding of, of that life and that world and uh, have some connection to the coaches, and, and so I have an opportunity this week as a dad to take my son and connect him to those same coaches as a, as a football player. And so in a, in a small way, I'm making a way. What about you, dads? What about your influence and your connections and, and your relationships? What can you do to leverage your relationships to make a way for somebody in your life? Maybe it's a kiddo, but maybe it's a coworker. Maybe you know you've got someone on your team at work and they're so talented and yet the ceiling is just not high enough for them with you, but you could open a door for them somewhere else. Man, a man of God says, I'm for you. Let me, let me, let me help get this door open. It's gonna mean that I lose an excellent team member, but I see the gifting on your life. Let me make a way for you. There's just so many ways I could talk about that. But what does it look like for you to be a way maker this week for somebody else? And then finally, again, how can we be multipliers? How can we leave things better than we found it? Man, I hope every man in the room will take that question to heart. Michaela Schifrin was a world champion skier and, uh, from America, and uh, it seems like five years ago now, but actually just the beginning of this year, we had the Winter Olympics, and perhaps you remember the name Michaela Schifrin, and the reason you would remember it is because news cycles were playing over and over again uh, how she actually did not live up to expectations at this past Winter Olympic Games. Um, we know that she had won, I gotta read it because it's so, there's so many things, 73 World Cup victories, the third most ever of any male or female skier, five world championships and three events, three Olympic medals and previous Olympics. And here she was uh, this past Winter Olympics, ready to, she was the favorite for gold. And obviously as, Amer as Americans, we were gonna be like, come on, Michaela, you know, you can do it. The first event, uh, women's a giant slalom, uh, she fell within just a few seconds of coming out of the gate um, and busted out of that event. And so that had be, kind of become this big deal. Oh my gosh, one of the favorite gold medals she, she wrecked on her first event. And then came uh, the Olympic slalom, her, her next event, a, a different type of slalom event, and she ended up crashing out of that one as well. She, total amount of time between the two races, the total amount of time she was actually on her skis was only 16 seconds. That's how quickly she had wiped out. And after winning all of these awards and medals, and she was heartbroken, just crushed. And I remember, if you saw the video, you, you can remember she was literally just sitting on the slope, not moving. And it wasn't because she was hurt. She was sitting up, and she was just in complete shock of what has just happened. My entire life, everything I've worked for, all of my talent poured into this thing, what? What has happened? And I, I still remember, uh, they let her sit there for a little bit, but they're trying to run the, the, the next skiers and eventually someone comes over to her and are like, uh, can, you, can you please move? And she was just still so distraught. She just kind of slid over to the side of the course and then just still sat there. She didn't, even, she didn't even leave. She didn't take off her skis and walk back up and just alone on the ski slope. And man, my heart just went out there. I just like, oh my gosh, like, Where's her family and, and who, who's her coach and does anyone know her and is, is anyone initiating to protect and, and make a way and, and somehow multiply courage into her heart? Like where are the, where are the men in her life? Where, where are those that can gather around her? Where are her friends? And the heartbreak of all heartbreaks was then to find out later that her dad, Jeff, who had been so key in her life and such an encourager had actually passed away two years prior to this race. And so she didn't have a dad in her life anymore. And as they interviewed her at the bottom, she just, you know, she's trying to be a, uh, you know, a good sport about this. She's obviously won a lot of uh, championships. And so she was used to talking to the media, but you could just tell she needed to be poured into. She needed somebody to love on her. And the heartbreaking line was this, as she was asked questions about how she was gonna handle it. You know, how do you, how do you move on from something like this? You're a world champion, you know, the, the interviewers are just kind of trying to get her to say something to America. Basically, she said this, right now, I really would just like to call my dad. And that's all she could say. 
Dads, you're one of the most important figures in your family's life. And even when relationships are rocky, even when things, man, you feel like you may have let people down, there's something in the heart of every kid that just longs for dad to be there. Just longs for dad to show up. Just longs for dad to, to love on them. And so this morning, men, I, again, this is not a, a kick in the rear. This is an invitation to rise up and be who you truly are. Be who you truly desire to be. Be who God has made you to be for the people in your life. I've never met a woman who gets upset when a man initiates, protects, makes a way, and multiplies. Never met that woman. I've never met a kiddo in my life that gets upset when dad initiates, when dad protects, when dad makes a way, when dad multiplies himself into other people's lives. It's who you're made to be. And not only that, because God himself has modeled it for us in Jesus, and because he gives us his Holy Spirit, it doesn't have to be an ideal. It can be who you really are. You can step into that today. You can step into being a man of God. So let's decide together to be initiators, to be protectors, to be waymakers, and to be multipliers. Before we stand and pray to end our time, I, I want to read you one final scripture. This is from 1 Kings chapter 2. Uh, King David knew he was about to die and he was going to give a charge to his son Solomon. And this is what he said. He said, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. And listen, I love this. So be strong, act like a man. Act like a man. You know, in today's world, this world wants to castrate all men. I, it, just, it just does. It, it wants to make men more feminine and make the, the women more masculine and just kind of, and I just want you to know there's a healthy and an appropriate place to act like a man. Amen? And so the scripture today says to you, act like a man. How, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? You initiate, you protect, you make a way for others, you lay your life down, and you multiply what God's given you you give it away to somebody else. You don't rule over. You don't hold people under your thumb. You don't demand that they submit to you. You act like Jesus, a servant leader, making a way for others. He goes on, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him. Keep his decrees and his commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. Man, my prayer for you today is that you would act like a man. Be an initiator, be a protector, be a way maker, be a multiplier. Lay your life down for others. As we close our time, I wanna be just be an honor for me to be able to bless all of the dads in the room. And so if you're a father, I wanna ask you to stand to your feet just right where you are. We wanna celebrate you and then we wanna pray for you. Can we celebrate these men? Just stay standing right where you are. I just want to look at all of you and just say again, we're so grateful and thankful for you. You play such an important role in your family, in our church, and in the community, and none of us are perfect. No man standing in this room is perfect, but we all have on the inside of us a deposit of the Holy Spirit if we're followers of Jesus. And so God's put you in a place of influence in your family and for your kids and for your place at work where he wants to move through you. And so I wanna pray that over you. If you're with one of these dads today, if you're seated next to them, would you just place a hand on their shoulder as a family to bless them? And let's pray together as we bless them in. Lord God, we're so grateful for the dads in this room. We're so grateful for the calling to be a dad. And Lord, we know and understand what is required of us Lord, but we fall short so often as dads. We, we mess up and we have the best intentions and then we end up letting people down and it breaks our heart, Lord. But today, these men that are standing, I know their desire. I know their desire is to rise up, to be initiators, to be protectors, to be way makers, to be multipliers. And so by the power of the Holy Spirit, we just pray that into their hearts, 
and into their souls and into their spirits today, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you fill them afresh and new by the power of the Holy Spirit? Lord, I pray that they would go out from this place today full of energy, full of encouragement, full of assurance that you are with them, that they are not alone. And the calling to be a man of God is on their life. And it's not going to be lorded over others. It's going to look like servant leadership. But Lord, would you empower them to do that today? We say as their family, we say we're so grateful for them. We say that we need them. And we ask that their giftings would be released in our midst and that their multiplying effect would be experienced and felt in our church. We love you and we love these men. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, buddy. We love you guys. God bless you. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you next week.